Brother, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's a joy to be here. So for some context, um, Abayagiri Monastery, a branch of Ajahn Chah's lineage, which I ordained in, and I spent several, uh, about a year and a half at Abayagiri, uh, Ajahn Kovelo ordained there, is next door to uh, Mount Tabor Monastery. And every Christmas morning, we'd go over with a bag of cookies and treats and get to talk with the monks there. And people often ask how monastics of different traditions relate. And I, I don't know exactly what your experience with this is, this is, brother, but I've always felt a huge kinship with monastics of other tradition. And our hair balances out each other, which is helpful. So it's uh, it was really, I felt significant that you agreed to actually talk uh, more in depth. And our traditions share many things in common. So thank you again for taking the time. I hope I hoped I could introduce the monastery a bit and then maybe have you introduce yourself a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Holy Transfiguration Monastery or Mount Tabor is a contemplative Eastern Catholic monastery, part of the worldwide Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church under the leadership of his beautitude. I'm going to pronounce this wrong. Sviatoslav Shesh Shuk. Eastern Catholics nice. are Orthodox. Did I get it right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Eastern Catholics are Orthodox Catholics who live in full and visible communion with the Holy See of Rome and pray for the Pope as Holy Ecumenical Hierarch. Our brothers and fathers come to the contemplative life from many different backgrounds and histories, but we're all called to meet God in silence and stillness, following the advice of Saint Seraphim of Sarov, Sarov acquire inner peace and a thousand souls around you will be saved. So, brother, how would you supplement um, that understanding of our understanding of your tradition? And after that, how would you, these are two huge questions. Maybe let's begin with, how did you come get drawn into robes? And then you can tell us what that entails. How about that? Into robes is a great way to put it. Yeah, uh, I grew up in... Um, as a Roman Catholic. Um, and so everyone has a picture of their mind of that, uh, somewhat, at least in the U S and, um, grew up as a Roman Catholic, went to a, a college, uh, at a Catholic school and felt for a long time that I wanted to be, or was battling for a long time about whether or not I wanted to be a priest. Um, however, also in the back of my mind, I knew that the, that monks existed but um didn't much know more than that i also knew that um the roman catholic church gets kind of short term the western church um meaning a christianity that has its history based in the ancient christians of the western roman empire and then history you know proceeds from there um and i knew vaguely the existence of the eastern Christians, which are the Christians who have their ancient history in the Eastern Roman uh, Empire. And then, you know, history proceeds from there. And so these two things that I kind of had vague understandings of were just very far away from me. I had very little experience of them. Um, but whenever, whenever I could catch, and, you know, with the internet growing as I grew up, um, the more I could catch about it, the more interested I got. Um, I always felt a very close, um, a, a need to stay very close to the church um, and close to Jesus. Uh, so my my education, my career for a long time was in church work, was um, trying to deepen my prayer, trying to express that prayer life in either things like um, what we call evangelization or in other uh, some other forms of works of mercy or generosity. And, um, and doing that while living in the world didn't never matched. And so I started visiting a lot of different communities. And one of those communities was this place, uh, the monks of Mount Tabor at Holy Transfiguration Monastery. I was living in the Bay Area in Oakland at the time, uh, doing church work and that um, exhausted me. So I came here for a one day retreat, and then a four day retreat, and then a two week retreat. And then um, I asked to stay as a what's called a postulant, um, kind of an intern. Um, 
and where and that was ooh this um no i came as a postulant um august of 2022 hmm. and um after six months of that i was um what's called tonsured they they cut off all my hair i looked they, they we always make oh you look like you're you're at a value gary <laughs> and um um they cut off my hair and then um the the custom is they cut off your hair they tonsure you um at this new stage when you become a novice um and then you just kind of you just let it grow um and never really give a full trim again although there's plenty that will shorten it as as a symbol of uh, staying away from vanity although a full bald is also staying away from vanity um a, a symbol of simplicity and um there's a in in the art of the of the eastern church um long hair is a symbol of spiritual energy spiritual power hmm. um so the angels have humongous hairdos um, i had to ask i had to ask the abbot once why why does the angel gabriel have this giant beehive and it's like oh it's because he's an angel <laughs> um so that happened to me this past february um i was given the name zacharias um zacharias is hebrew for um he remembers god zakar yah yahs and yahweh he remembers god um memory is very important in the christian tradition um uh, there are many places, in fact, in our in our funerals, we say, let their memory be eternal. May God always remember them. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just bringing someone to mind. Um, um, for us, for a human, um, to remember someone is also to um, keep, keep near you all the meaning that is applied to that person. Um, and if that person was a teacher of, of any ways to keep those teachings, for God to remember you is to mm. keep you in existence, is to keep you uh, living eternally. And so um, in our funeral prayers, let their memory be eternal. There are many places in the Bible where we were asked where it, God remembers so and so. God remembers the um, the Israelites who were in Egypt. God remembers uh, where we ask God to remember us. Um, um, the a great prayer is remember me jesus remember me lord when you come into your kingdom that 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 was first prayed by someone who was being crucified right next to jesus uh so um he it's also the name of the father of john the baptist and he has his own story in the gospel of luke which i found i find very inspiring there's also some side um legends or apoc what we call apocryphal stories that have been part of the oral tradition of Christianity, if, um, though not scripture mm -hmm. um, specifically. They're part of the oral tradition of Christianity and they reveal Zacharias to be someone who really knows what God's doing. He just he has this intuition and is willing to, um, to do things that to an outsider look absolutely bizarre. Mm -hmm. um, but because he's intuitively there with how God works, um, they always work out to a more glorified living. I um, it, the resonance of the term memory is very interesting for us. Uh, sati mindfulness actually is related to the root kar, which or sar, which is memory. Kar for us is similar. Oh, okay. It means to do. There's a lot of Indo-Aryan uh, resonance between the languages, yeah. I think. But what did you feel you were forgetting that this helped you remember, and how did you realize you were forgetting it? It's something I still do. Um, oftentimes, I just remember I um, I forget the eternal presence of God, um, and it's part of our life as kind of scheduled here is back and forth between work and prayer. Um, you schedule a set amount of time for work, a set amount of time for prayer, and the idea is to um because we are we we are embodied work is is a very necessary part of how we live but it must also be its own prayer which 
Um, and so there are constant um, writers, one in the, in the Roman Catholic tradition, Brother Lawrence, he wrote the uh, Practicing the Presence of God. All, all it is, it's like a little 50 page book about just remember that God is there with you while you're cooking. <laughs> remember that God is with you while you're cleaning. And, and I found that to be, you know, in my pride, I found that to be so dumb. And then I realized how impossible it was for me. I could, I am always stopping and realizing I just spent the last hour and a half not remembering that God is there. Um, I just spent the last day um, absolutely forgetting that all of my actions are in the context of my soul being placed in front of, of the divine. Was there a moment in your life before that where you really realized that you'd, you'd forgotten or maybe had a memory or a moment of grace so powerful that it made you realize how 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 lost you'd been before that? Or was it more this gradual movement? It can be okay if it's less dramatic. I'm just curious if there was yeah, a moment, my, a moment of grace. I don't have a ton of dramatic moments. I, I apologize. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. But... Um, I think the first time, this is a very sideways answer. It doesn't exactly answer what you're saying, but in general, um, it's been a, it's been just more of a slow slope reminder of, of getting back, which is why the alternating is so good. You get, you get back to prayer and it's a very adamant insistence that you remember God right now. And, and so um, even if I spent all morning not thinking about God, there's this set time, the bell rings and you think about God and you apologize for not thinking about God for the last so many hours. Um, I think the first time that I recognized memory in and of itself to be so important um, was speaking to Christians in El Salvador. Um, El Salvador had a brutal, brutal civil war all through the 1980s. And before that was um, this utter repression of, of a very large poor population by a small aristocracy. And it was the Christians in the area. Archbishop Romero, I believe. Archbishop Romero is a, a hero of mine and um, who, who really fought and, and were very explicit because, you know, even, even this aristocracy went to church on Sunday. They were Christians. Um, vocally saying they were and they said no as christians you will not treat the poor like this as christians you will not treat you know you will not you will not do these god has said so and then archbishop says your bishop with the power that a bishop says is is demanding it and when they started standing up like that um they started getting killed and um so christians and in particular catholics in el salvador regard the 20th century and in the 1980s in particular as an era of martyrdom, um, just like, just like it was under the worst parts of the Roman empire. Um, and they, they talk about today, talk about remembering the martyrs and they say it's an act. It's a radical act to remember the martyrs. It is, it is, it's an act of, of spiritual significance as well as significance in social justice. And this combination that both of them were in this act of just recalling the story of somebody was, was huge to me, how it had material and spiritual and religious repercussions mm -hmm. all at once. And so when, when other things get said about memory, let, let their memory be eternal, for example, it, it gave me this scaffolding for everything else to kind of click into that um that really helped me and so when it when it when when i got to turn it on myself which really mostly happened here um at the monastery and be like are you remembering god in the same way that you know with the same intensity that you've been told to remember the martyrs um because when you remember god you also remember who you are in front of god hmm. and and you remember God's God's chosen relationship with you, um, how God chooses to act toward you. So some of what I'm hearing you talk about is this, the power of seeing that apex of 
existence or being or or i mean there's maybe not a word or description we can apply to god but that embodied or signaled in reality living and breathing reality by these moments of you know say martyrdom in in el salvador like what are people giving themselves to and and then coming to the monastery and 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 obviously it playing out in a much less dramatic way but still I do find this um, interplay between the highest of ideals um, and goals and then the practical day-to-day -day means you're talking about getting there, like working and praying and the schedule. So would you sort of describe a bit of that dichotomy as it's embodied at the monastery? What is the daily schedule? What is the prayer? Like, is it the Jesus prayer as recited in way of the pilgrim and what is god <laughs> so three big questions but like what is what is, what is sainthood look like um, yeah i'll remind you if you forget any of those but, uh, i'm gonna write this down okay all three so the schedule of the monastery uh -huh. the practice of prayer and then i'll leave the third but it's as a sneak preview i'm interested in knowing what sainthood or what sainthood basically is what yeah how could a person become to god yeah so the easy part the easy part of the answer um this monastery schedule starts at 5 30 in the morning with um uh morning prayer um and that um seamlessly moves into what we call the divine liturgy um uh i'll just give you the time frame and then give you kind of the meaning within it um we then after that breakfast in silence with a reading um uh, currently we're reading out of what's known as the Evergetinos, which is a, um, a collection of the sayings of the, the Desert Fathers and the Monastic Fathers. Mm -hmm. um, then we have work. I'm the, I'm the gardener, so I do garden work from 8.30 to noon every day. Um, noon is noon prayer, followed by lunch. And, uh, and then the afternoon is dedicated to a uh, quiet uh, study and prayer. Um, so I, I tell people if I have indoor work, it's, it'll happen in the afternoon. Um, if I have outdoor work, it happens in the morning. And, um, the, um, that's also when things like a class will happen on, on Thursdays, uh, on Tuesdays about monasticism. Like we, we hold a class on, um, on um, our own rule, the monastery's rule, and, and the spirituality Im imbued in it, we hold a choir rehearsal on Saturday. Uh, that always will happen in the afternoon. Um, the evening starts at 4.30 with about 40, 45 to an hour of evening prayer. Then dinner. Um, dinner is a more recreation time. We, we talk and chat and enjoy ourselves. And then night prayer. <laughs> After night prayer is what's known as the, uh, the great silence. Um, so across the whole day, there's, uh, what we call the gentle silence. You, you know, if you got to talk, it's absolutely fine. Um, but the preference is for quiet to allow for that remembering God, um, at between night prayer and breakfast is, uh, is the great silence is a deep silence. Avoid each other. The only time you should talk is really something's on fire and, um, otherwise it can wait till tomorrow because right now is the time set aside for a direct, um, mm. speaking to God or, or sleeping, mm. whichever one is most needed at the moment. Um, so what the prayers actually mean. Yeah. What is, so in what the is morning, the prayer? Yeah, please. um, in the morning. So the prayer, when we get together is actually kind of noisy, um, even compared to roman catholicism um which has a lot of singing and speaking but there's always it always kind of um reverts to a silence reverts is the wrong word but um it kind of naturalizes to quiet whereas prayer in the eastern church um the catholics and the orthodox it, it opens up into singing and does not stop hmm. and the singing is back and forth of um between the congregation and and the um the clergy this sort of interplay between these two kinds of um 
these two roles. And in the morning, it's it, it matches the sun coming up. He, the, the morning prayer starts with no lights on. There's like two candles on in the whole building. And we sing a few of the Psalms um, out of the Bible that are about God, I'm dying. God, forgive me. God, uh, take me out of the grave, all of this stuff. And then, um, and then we turn on all the lights and sing the Lord is God and has appeared to us. And so it is a death and rebirth happens every morning. Mm -hmm. Um, we, uh, um, we, and then we specifically sing the prayers asking for forgiveness, um, because nighttime is a time of darkness and therefore a time of sin. Mm -hmm. Um, which I always thought was funny in the, in the Western Christianity, you sing the prayers asking for forgiveness at the end of the day. Um, and so I, I like to joke, Eastern Christians assume you get all your sinning done at night and Western <laughs> Christians assume you get all your sinning done during the day. But, um, so there's these prayers of, uh, of forgiveness and, and then, and then prayers of praise. And then we start singing songs. They're, they're, they're called stickera, which just means is Greek for verses. Um, these verses back and forth of very dense theology. Um, the music of our services is, is regarded as a source of tradition. It's how the, it's one of the methods that the teachings of, of Christianity get passed on. Um, so they themselves hold, you know, it's very difficult to change them, for example, uh, because they, they hold um, our doctrine. And, or, um, oral tradition in the Buddhist world has been the same. It is, mm -hmm. That was how they were passed for hundreds of years, and it was mm -hmm. far more reliable than writing, actually. Yeah. So. yeah. It really bothers me when someone says, oh, that's oral tradition. You can't trust them. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Human beings have this incredible method of passing mm -hmm. um, orally um, incredibly wise things. And um, usually okay. written tradition is a product of oral tradition and not the other way around. Um, so our music is, is kind of part of that. Um, and so our prayer always returns to the Psalms of the Bible, um, which shows, um, which is something we have in common with Judaism and, uh, the Psalms. Um, then in the morning, at least it moves into what's called divine liturgy. Um, so the divine liturgy is the kind of the apex of worship in Christianity. Um, in Roman Catholicism, it's called the, the Holy Mass. And this is um, a, an offering to God of what God has already given to us. So the first is um, kind of our, ourselves and our own, our own action through singing, uh, through our prayers, through our presence. Um, but also we are bringing us. So whatever I've done outside of church, I've brought into it. Um, and ho hopefully it was right, you know, and that's why we've, we've said our prayers of forgiveness before that. Um, and then there's the, uh, um, the reading directly from scripture, things, things that Jesus did and said, things that, um, St. Paul typically said afterward. Um, and, and this I, is, go on. yeah. Oh. oh, I just, I'll be curious. I, I do want to know how this works its way into the internal prayer as well that you hold yes. through the day. Yes. Go on, because that, um, that's, I think, where we'll find even more resonance. But please, yeah. I, I, this is fascinating to hear about. The, um, so we, we read these, and these are um, ways of thinking about God. Um, but then it becomes a direct encounter with God, which is um, the uh, um, the in 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 our in our services and that is bread and wine being turned into mystically the body and blood um the full body blood and soul and divinity of christ and then offered on an altar back to god this is um and and then cons you know consumed by us eaten by us so as to facilitate us becoming more like God and, and unified with God. Um, 
So here I think is, is where we can start answering your question. Um, these are all external things done publicly, done vocally. Um, but underneath it all is the human soul, the human heart of each one of us standing in that room. Um, a lot of a lot of the monks will simply say the Jesus prayer while it's happening. Um, there's also the fact that you're surrounded by images of of Jesus Christ and all the saints, and there's an entire spirituality on iconography that that type of art, which my abbot is actually an iconographer. He could go off for hours about it, um, but really, it's it's allowing heaven to gaze upon you. Um, and allow that to, to work within you. This, so what you have is union with God, meditation with God, meditation on dogma, direct supplication for God and, and, and um, that meeting so that the actual meditating will happen typically by yourself, either in those afternoons in, at night or right after one of the services. There's typically a, a, a chunk of time for quiet with all the monks there. And will, will that entail the recitation of the Jesus prayer, which uh, we'd love to, to hear you recite if you're willing, and, yeah. or, and or does that dissolve into, I believe the cloud of unknowing states it as the naked intent towards God, um, and something something like that like what um what's the what's the goal of that abiding um so yeah give us a little more description of the internal med, uh, meditative or prayer experience let me start with the goal because i will forget the goal of the abiding is the complete transformation of my personal will into the will of God. Um, another way to put it is to blur the line between myself and God. Um, yet another way to put it is to just become all flame. And um, this is actually significant in the name of the monastery. Um, the transfiguration was an event in the life of Christ where three of his disciples witness him in his full glory. He was transfigured in front of them. He changed his look and he was bursting with light. Then they fell to the ground. Um, Mount Tabor, the other name of the monastery, is the place um, where that happened. And the um, there's been a lot of prayer and discussion about what that light was. Um, and it seems that it, it was what's called the uncreated light of God. Um, in Hebrew, they will, uh, you might even say the Shekinah, um, uh, which is something that Hebrew mysticism or Jewish mysticism has really picked up on. Um, and that's actually, that's actually what halos are um, in, mm -hmm. in Christian art. So that's the goal is, um, is the, is a genuine abiding in God and which is funny because it's a God who acts. So um, um, it will it will affect the things you do the next day, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, when you're actually trying to pray, typically if you're either reading the Psalms out of scripture and, and either repeating the words back to yourself um, or just pondering them, um, meditating in the uh, in the mental prayer sense. Um, or, um, or suing, uh, picking up one of the, the holy writers across our history. Right now I'm reading, um, the life of St. Pacomius, kind of the first monk to gather together over a hundred brothers into one spot. And he's fascinating. And, uh, he teaches me a lot. Um, or it's reciting the Jesus prayer. Um, the Jesus prayer being just, um, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Um, there's a few expansions or contractions of that kind of formula, but that's that's the gist of it. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. In the book, um, The Way of the Pilgrim, 
um, that which we both love. Um, a, it, across our tradition, we uh, yeah, it's such a good account of a of a holy man. Go on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it says that within that prayer is the entire gospel, the entire proclamation of the Christian idea. Um, and is that Jesus is the son of God. His, I am a sinner and his relationship with me is one of mercy. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can fit yourself into that position, which is why repeating the prayer is so important because you'll always be knocked off of that position. Um, so if you repeat it to yourself, Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. You remind yourself to, to, to settle in that place with that relationship. Um, you will closer and over time, over years, I have, I have not become, you know, divinized in any way or, uh, met Christ in, in the, met in the words of the cloud of unknowing or become of all flame or whatever vocabulary put to it. That's. That's not my spiritual life right now. Um, I am literally a novice. You're, you're and, smoldering a little bit, at least in a good sense. So. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, the um, so that it's it's that repetition that gives a place for a possibility of that. Um, later within the the tradition, um, what's happened is ah. ah Mary just asked, what's the relationship between the body and, and this kind of prayer? I'm about to answer that. The, um, the, um, something with what got known as hesychasm got, um, got brought in and they express what's known as prayer of the heart, which is also in, in way of the pilgrim. And the way they express it is, um, try to pray while moving your mind into your heart which from where I stand is downright impossible is, and I, I keep, I keep asking my spiritual elders here at the monastery and it's, um, and they keep giving me very simple answers to something that I think is complicated, um, proving my noviceness, but it is an understanding that we can pray with our brain a lot you can repeat words with your brain which is fine um and and this is a bit of the answer to to mary's question in that every aspect of me my mind my body uh my voice is um is created good and therefore has good use um the and so in prayer there are specific body stances we prostrate a lot in our in our prayer but we also stand a lot in our prayer sitting is reserved for listening um listening to um scripture or to preaching um standing is typically the um um the way of prayer uh meditating you go ahead and sit but um and so that's a lot of it but a lot of times the the ones talking about prayer of the heart really wanted you to just put your head on your chest and breathe a lot. And mm -hmm. if you are, and again, deep, deep in the spiritual life beyond where I am, um, if you're someone who can move their mind, which is a good thing into the heart, which is after all the depths of you, the place from which you want to speak to God. Um, you are one achieving what prayer really is about in the human person, but two, you are entering into a place where your heart will be able to pray nonstop. Hmm. Um, my brain is unable to do that. Um, my heart with the proper training can. Thank you for describing that the analogs to how the unified mind is described in our tradition. And, and I know, you know, these are leaps that some in either tradition might be uncomfortable making, but there's definitely, uh, and I appreciate the integrity of difference, but that drop of the awareness from the head into the, the heart, this is where a lot of uh, teachers in our tradition say the chitta or the, 
kind of the mind heart lives and samadhi or unification of mind that's been cultivated will drop to the heart and center there. But that transition is especially difficult for moderns. And I think uh, what you're speaking to will resonate with, with many, as mm -hmm. will I think the sense of um, humility and love. I mean, we'd call it the Brahma Viharas, but um, the boundless abodes of loving kindness and compassion and certainly some of the, the aspects you're talking about of union with or really touching Christ or being on fire. Um, perhaps an unfortunate analogy in Southern or Northern California, but uh, yeah, <laughs> but, but really resonate with, with these aspects of, and I think that's why so many of us found the way of the pilgrims so moving is because we could see so much of our own tradition in that beautiful man wandering across Russia with a backpack full of bread in the 1800s. And if people haven't read that, Google way of the pilgrim and the pilgrim continues his way. It's amazing. Um, brother, do you mind if I bring in some questions from the chat? Sure. I've seen them whiz by. They're really I, good. I know. So let's, I agree. Venerable sirs, the life of St. Francis of Assisi has been the main bridge to talk about Buddhist monasticism with my Roman Catholic relatives. Is there anything joyful that inspires you about St. Francis? I love St. Francis. Who doesn't love St. Francis? Um, I love, or I love particularly about Frank, St. Francis. Um, oh, it's such a hippie answer. I love that he preached to the birds. Um, it's why he's, you know, there's statues of him with birds or on a bird bath or whatever. He wanted to preach to something. He wanted to just talk about how glorious the divine is to anyone around, but there were no people around, but there were birds there. So he said, you, look at you, Blue Jay. God has made you so beautiful and you sing so amazingly and look at how high you fly. And, the, and he goes down each of the birds that was in front of him. Hmm. And, um, and, and glorifies, and this is what's really famous about him. He can glorify God by reflecting the glory of created things. Hmm the um so much of the christian morality as well as the christian spirituality is about making sure that while you appreciate created things you never love them more than god because then something will get twisted hmm. and if but if you, especially if you can use them to glorify god that's um you're you're re you really are on the right path and saint francis kind of helped readjust the entirety of Western Europe or Western Christianity, reminding them of that. Um, preaching to the birds was a big part of that. Um, I want to, my, my brain is saying, say something about kissing the leper, say something about kissing the leper. I don't have anything deep to say about that. Yeah. Just that. Need to. That's, that's, <laughs> he did. that does it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. There's a famous teacher of the Chinese tradition named Shu Yun or Empty Cloud, who I believe gave the five precepts to a chicken. So nice. we, we can we can relate. That's a beautiful, uh -huh. beautiful answer. Thank you, brother. Good question, Joseph. When the Gird God is used, what are they referring to? Do they hear voices, see figures, feel a holy presence? Yeah. Um, I saw that one whiz by two and oh boy. Okay. <laughs> um, with the full understanding, I was just repeating the word God so many times in the past. Um, that's your job now. It is my job now, but also understanding that's there's a lot of translation that has to happen when speaking between Christians and Buddhisms about God specifically. Mm. Buddhisms. Um, God is, jeez. So, we put a lot of emphasis on what we call the Trinity of God. God is of course, um, the one who created everything, the source of all existence, uh, and therefore the source of all, all love, for example, and then the source of meaning within that existence. But God is also, and therefore completely unified. God is also three. This is the great mystery kind of buried at the, at the heart of Christianity. God, God is three. Um, 
And we give names to them, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the most famous two are God the Father, which is typically what people mean when they say God, just casually, the one who generates all, all of creation. God the Son being the other famous one, him being Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified and rose again. Um, and then the Holy Spirit being this um, being uh, this uncreated and en energetic love. Um, the Holy Spirit is is compared to the wind, to birds in flight, <laughs> and so it's very <laughs> very active and flitty and um, and powerful. Um, and so, especially now that ever since Jesus showed up, God is utterly spiritual and entirely outside of, of the created world. But God is also a person, a human who, who walked in certain places and had certain boundaries around his body. And, and therefore relates to us on that very specific way. So to go back to the, the question, do I, have I ever like seen a form of God? Not necessarily. I've never had an apparition of God. Um, I do interact with God daily in a physical sense through our communion, mm. through our Eucharist, this mystical change of, of bread into body that I then eat. Um, that's its own mystery. Um, that I interact with. It looks like a piece of bread. Um, and therefore, you shouldn't actually stare at it for all that long because you'll you'll trick yourself <laughs> um, because it's actually an entrance into a mystery um, of, of how God has decided to um, enter into the physical world that is that is not distinct from himself. Mm -hmm. Um, that being said, of course, there are very holy people that have heard the voice of God, um, and even less holy people that have heard the whole voice of God. Um, and these are, these are more mystical, less material ways that, um, that God enters into the, into the physical world. Um, um, and to the third part, there is such thing as kind of a sense of the presence of God. Hmm. Um, a prayerful person can usually tell whether a moment is more holy or not. That might be true across traditions. Even. No, thank you. And uh, some of your descriptions of the Holy Spirit resonate deeply with the Buddha's description of the enlightened mind. I'm mm -hmm. very wary of drawing too clear parallels. And, you know, at, at a certain point, you know, I think there's been great masters in every tradition and at a certain point, language just breaks down and who knows if they're talking about it the does. same thing or not, but I assume some of them probably are. And the Buddha compares the enlightened mind to light that lands on nothing. So birds in flight or the wind, um, there's a beautiful resonance there at least. And thank you for speaking to that. I think we have one more minute and maybe we can even stretch to two. Okay. So let's take another one. Wonderful to see friendships and understanding being made between traditions. And uh, let's see, we did that one. I agree. <laughs> Good. What are, oh, end with an easy one. Maybe not, yeah. but maybe, I don't know. What are women's places, what are women's place in monasticism in your institutions? Yeah, we have um, wi women's monasteries. Uh, they, the nearest Ukrainian one, was in Illinois, but I don't know what's what what they're and there's one in Indiana, Christ the Bridegroom, it's called. Mm -hmm. And um it is common knowledge that nuns are holier than monks. Um that's just a fact. Um the within the written tradition there is a little bit less of a presence of women. However you will find desert mothers um you will find uh, plenty of holy women, especially in the last couple centuries, um, holy women that were stated as such while they were still alive and so now have books printed about them mm -hmm. and to people who, who follow them. How, um, and that being said, 
um, it cannot be forgotten um, about the the role of of Mary, of Jesus's mother, who if this was this was a, a a question we kind of brushed aside, but you at, you said once in an email, let's talk about the cosmologies of our two traditions. And there's a huge cosmology of ranks of angels and all that. The top two being the cherubim and seraphim. Mm -hmm. And every day, multiple times a day, we sing to the Virgin Mary, you are more honorable than the cherubim and beyond compare more glorious than the seraphim. Mm -hmm. This very high place of a human woman. And who becomes the exemplar and the help of all Christians and um, it's beautiful saints often named Mary, Mary of Egypt is one of them. I we'll just read speak. about her. She was an amazing, amazing person. Yes. Yes. Um, so, but in terms of our institutions today, um, they are usually separate, separate institutions, separate monasteries built by women for the spiritual formation of women. And I encourage anyone, especially women Christians and women who want to pray more, to go to these monasteries. Thank you, brother, for that answer and um, the sneak preview of uh, what may be a future conversation on our parallel cosmologies, because many people come to Buddhism thinking they're getting kind of a dry, secular take on things. And we have a, a pretty wild cosmology as well. And I, I think that the ranks of angels correspond very well to the levels of heaven that we have. So interesting, definitely a conversation there, but we don't have time right now. So yeah. let me just say, um, yeah, you're, I, I think the world needs more monastics right now. And it does. the first, um, you know, the first years in robes can, I think be quite a, quite a battle in many ways for me, they certainly were, but I just, it's such a joy to see another brother taking these this path um in in some respect at least and and it and a deeply sincere one that i respect immensely and i hope i get to meet you in person sometimes and i wish you all the best on your monastic journey and the same to you thank you so much for your generosity and warmth and i thank you for the encouragement i i really appreciate it and thanks to everyone who's been um chatting with us is very, they're very uh thoughtful and and helpful well, we hope you, we get you on again sometime. And if you're ever near Seattle, please visit us. We don't actually have a monastery, but we have it. We meet in a gym, so we have that. Um, nice. And uh, for those who are tuned in, we're going to have our usual Zoom meeting after the uh, live stream. So I've pasted the link into the chat. For those who can't see it, just go to clearmountainmonastery.org. Go to the Wednesday uh, event listing, and you'll find the uh, Zoom link there. And we'll continue to speak in a more intimate setting afterwards. Brother, best of luck. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. God bless.